Okay. <coughs> Okay. Okay, so yesterday, let me summarize uh, briefly the some main point. So we saw that if we start with a very simple uh, free uh, conformal field theory uh, and a collection of uh, n complex ma massless scalar fields, let's say in three dimensions. So this uh, i runs from 1 to n, and this phi transforms in the fundamental of uh, some un global symmetry. And if we look at the un singlet sector of uh, operators in this theory, then this singlet sector is very simple. There is a scalar operator, which I denote as J0, which is just uh, phi square. And then there is a collection of uh, uh, operators with in all integer spins, which are exactly conserved operators. So these are uh, bilinears with S derivatives schematically. They are conserved. Okay, so this operate this scalar operator here has dimension uh, one in three dimensions. Uh, in general dimension, it will have dimension d minus two. If we're in dimension d, these operators have dimension s plus one, or in general s plus d minus two. And then we so. We saw that uh, by the usual rules of ADS-CFT, this uh, uh, single sector, single trace operators should correspond to single particle states in some ADS theory. And we see that this spectrum is in one-to-one uh, -one correspondence with the spectrum of the bosonic uh, higher spin theory, uh, Vasiliev theory in ADS-4, which has a scalar field. I x z with m square equal minus two in units of the ADS radius, and the collection of uh, all integer spin gauge fields which are massless. Okay, <coughs> and we expect that all these fields will uh, interact in some non-trivial way because from this ADS theory we are supposed to be able to recover the non-trivial correlation functions of these operators. For example, uh, so let me draw a picture which is slightly, oh, I shouldn't go there, that's forbidden. Uh, let me draw a picture which is slightly different from what I was drawing yesterday. So let me denote this plane as the boundary and this as the z direction. Here we have some operators at the boundary, let's say a three-point function of these operators. We can compute it here by just uh, some uh, simple Feynman diagram, with, uh, simple free propagator weak contraction. But if we want to compute it from ADS, then there will be some non-trivial interaction in the bulk of the fields dual to this object. So this is the bulk of ADS. This is the boundary. And here there is some coupling constant. It's a bit too small. Uh, okay, uh, but the picture is fairly obvious, so is it too small from the back? Anyway, it's just another way of drawing the diagram that I was drawing yesterday, which is the Witten diagram, where we have the operators here and some interaction. And that in interaction, if we see how this uh, correlation function scale with n in the dual theory, tells you that the Newton constant in the bulk is goes like 1 over n. Okay, just at the, at the end of the lecture, um, uh, I also said that we could consider a real version, a real scalar version of this uh, duality, where we can take just a real scalar fields and uh, 
consider the ON singlet sector. Then the spectrum of uh, single trace operators contains only even, even uh, spin currents. And this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with what is called the minimal higher spin theory in ADS4, which has this, uh, uh, which has a scalar field, which is the same as there, and has all the massless even spin currents. Um, all right. So here, again, I'm writing it in three dimension because that's what I will mostly focus on. But uh, this duality uh, can be phrased in any dimension, and these theories, these higher spin theories, exist in any dimension. Uh, we will not write down what, probably, what the general dimension theory looks like. We will write down the four-dimensional one. But just keep in mind that this, uh, this theory have a generalization to ADS D plus 1 for general D. Okay. <coughs> so any question about uh, this? Yeah, we'll discuss that uh, soon enough. OK, <clears throat> before going to the fermions, um, let me discuss uh, something else interesting. So first, let me say that these dualities between vector models and uh, higher spin theories uh, were first uh, stated in, a, in the most precise way by Klebanov and Polyakov. in 2002. So some uh, understanding of the, the fact that uh, some, uh, a free field theory should be related to some higher spin theory in ADS was already clear before this work. There was works by Sonborg, Witten, Setzgin, and Sandel. <coughs> but it was Klebanov and Polyakov who first pointed out clearly the special role of vector models in this duality. Uh, so as, as we discussed yesterday, the difference between vector models and uh, general adjoint type uh, models is that uh, the spectrum of single trace operators is very simple. And it's really in one-to-one -one correspondence with, uh, with the simplest higher spin theory that you, you, you have. Okay. <coughs> All right. So these dualities are already kind of interesting because if they are correct, they are some example of uh, exact ADS-CFT duality, which doesn't involve supersymmetry and doesn't involve string theory, at least not obviously. So from some conceptual uh, standpoint, they are definitely interesting. They may help to understand more uh, uh, precisely how ADS-CFT work at some basic level, because we have some very simple duality with very simple spectra, which is much, much simpler than a the duality between any any for superior mills and type to be string theory, which has a much larger spectrum. But okay, but uh, still a duality between free theories. And you may ask whether we can do something more interesting. Whether we can we could uh, discuss some generalization of this, where um, we have some interacting theory on this side. So this was also one of the main points of the paper uh, by Klebanov and Polyakov, who pointed out that basically in the same framework. We can discuss also interacting versions of these vector models. And uh, <coughs> here I have more space. So instead of, uh, now let me s stick with real fields for simplicity. Instead of the free ON vector model, we can consider the standard uh, textbook example of interacting version of this model, which is obtained by adding a quartic interaction for the scalar fields. Right? We can add. Quartic interaction, right? Uh, now, the dimension of this coupling constant, as you can uh, check easily, is uh, 4 minus d, right? In particular, in dimension 3, it has dimension 1. So, this uh, deformation of this conformal field theory, of this free conformal field theory, is, uh, is a relevant deformation. In dimension less than four, okay. So in D less than four, this is a relevant formation. 
<coughs> and as it, it's well known, this relevant deformation triggers some uh, RG flow from the free theory in the UV to some non-trivial interacting theory in the IR. So there is a flow here UV and here IR. Some RG flow which is triggered by this phi to the fourth interaction. <coughs> here we have the free ON model. And here we have some uh, non-trivial critical ON model, which is some interacting conformal field theory with ON symmetry, which you reach after you do this RG flow. Now, as you probably all know, a standard, standard uh, way to study this flow quantitatively is to use the epsilon expansion. That's the textbook way, the Wilson-Fisher approach. If you work uh, in d equal 4 minus epsilon, uh, then you can uh, compute the beta function for this coupling constant. <coughs> right, and then you see that there is a non-trivial IR fixed point where lambda star is of order epsilon, which solves the beta function equal to zero. And that's, the, that's this non-trivial uh, conformal field theory, this non-trivial interacting conformal field theory that is here in the IR. So if I work in form minus epsilon, that's very close to the free one because the coupling is of order epsilon. So this, this, in this uh, framework, this flow is perturbative. But at the end of the day, we are interested in d equal 3, in integer dimension 3, where this is some interacting, uh, <coughs> interacting safety with one symmetry. Of course, one could... Uh, push this epsilon expansion to higher orders, and then there are uh, powerful techniques to resum them and so on, and obtain estimates for uh, what dimensions of operators are at this fixed point, for example, in d equal 3. And of course, these ON models are just part of the family of the, uh, in, to which the three-dimensionalizing model belongs that you learned about last week, right? So the three-dimensionalizing model is just the n equal 1. Uh, example of this flow, right? <coughs> okay. Is this familiar to everyone? Okay, we haven't yet said what this has to do with higher spins, but we will get there uh, soon. So that's one approach, the epsilon expansion. Another approach, uh, I need a big board. So I'll do it here. Another approach in which one can study this, uh, uh, these fixed points, which can actually be carried out uh, in any dimension uh, between 2 and 4, and in particular in dimension 3, is to use the large n expansion. So <clears throat> let me briefly go through this, uh, because if you haven't seen it, this is something which may be useful. So one way to, one standard way to trick this quartic interaction in the large n expansion is to introduce some auxiliary field, right? You probably have, maybe some of you have seen this. So we, you introduce this, uh, this field sigma, which is sometimes called hubbard stratonovich field. So you just to rewrite uh, that theory by introducing an extra field. You can see that if you integrate out sigma by its equations of motion, you get back the original theory. Now, this action, as written in this form, is uh, more suitable to develop the large n expansion. And one simple calculation that we can do in the large n expansion, uh, well, using this, uh, this action, is to integrate out now the, the fields, the scalar fields, because the action is quadratic, and uh, get some effective action for this field sigma. Okay? <laughs> Let me write down here the, the simple important fact that if you uh, if, well, by the equations of motion, this sigma field is related to the phi square field, okay? That, that's 
obvious, it's trivial, but it's important. So now I'm integrating out phi's, and I want to uh, find out what is the two-point function of sigma at the IR fixed point, and that will tell us what happened to this phi-square operator in the RG flow. Okay, <coughs> so now we integrate out phi's. Okay, so. If you integrate out phi's, you just get uh, something like this. Right? So integrate out phi's, you get uh, uh, the determinant of the, operate, the, the kinetic operator on phi, which is nabla square plus sigma. And then you just exponentiate it. And now you can expand this in powers of sigma. OK, let me write this as uh, this, where s sigma sigma is the following form. So if you start expanding this determinant in powers of sigma, uh, the linear term is just some tadpole diagram. It's just the in something like the integral over of 1 over p square. And that can be set to 0, for, for example, in dimensional regularization. So the first term is the quadratic term. <coughs> so there is, of course, still this uh, s square over 4 lambda there. Uh, and then from the term quadratic in sigma, where you expand this uh, determinant, that term can be represented in the following way, which is not difficult to see, and it's left as an exercise. You can write the quadratic term as a double integral. where this 0 denotes the expectation value in the free theory. Okay? So if you look at the original action, what happened in the large limit when you integrate out phi to leading order is basically that you just replace, you, you just get sigma sigma and the two-point function of that phi field. But you can see that explicitly by expanding this uh, determinant. So this term with uh, is the term which has uh, two propagators, 1 over nabla square sigma, 1 over nabla square sigma. And that's the two-point function. You get a prop one propagator, two propagators. OK? <coughs> All right. It's more convenient to write this in momentum space. In momentum space, we get a sigma. Now, not keeping track of uh, overall constants, which are not very important. OK, so that's what you get. This, this term is just this term. OK, and this term is what you get after you do this. Uh, you go to momentum space and do this integral in momentum space. OK, n just comes because you have uh, n in this correlator, right? You have delta j, delta j r, you get an n, OK? All right, so this is, then there are higher order terms. Higher order terms. OK? <coughs> but this is enough if we, if we want to know what is the uh, leading two-point function of the sigma field. OK, so, so far I, I'm just uh, doing I'm just uh, massaging this uh, theory and the uh, two path integral over phi and get some action for sigma. Now we want to take the IR limit. Okay, so what happens in the IR limit? We want to see what happens at low momenta in this action. Now you see that if we are in D less than 4, 
then this power is negative, and this term for low momenta is dominant compared to this term. Okay, so in the IR limit, this term that gives a negligible contribution. Okay. All right. That means that in the in this uh, IR limit of low momenta, we get a very simple uh, kinetic term in momentum space for the sigma, which is just a power of p. And we can invert it to get the two-point function of sigma. So the two-point function will just be, in momentum space, simply the inverse of, the, of that kinetic term there. And now you can do a Fourier transform and get the two-point function of sigma in coordinate space. And that will be some constant, which I didn't keep track of. I just want to know what's the scaling. But you can fix the constant as well. If you do the Fourier transform of this, just do the integral over p with e to the i p dot x, you get this. So we see that in the IR limit, sigma is like a scalar primary operator. With dimension. What's the conformal dimension of this operator? Two, right? With dimension two, <coughs> plus one over n corrections, because this is just a leading calculation, the two-point function, and we have dropped this uh, higher-order terms. Why they are one over n? Well, one one way to uh, develop the one, the one over n expansion is to define the sigma field so that the two-point function scales like 1. So you could redefine sigma, same sigma over to sigma over square root n. Then you will get a factor of n here if you do that rescaling. And then the leading two-point function is of order 1, right? OK, maybe I should, uh, well, in your notes you can write it. I don't want to write the thing again. And then you get powers of n here, right? So after you take this IR limit where you drop this coupling, now you, you have a, a new coupling, which is uh, 1 over n, which you can put in by rescaling sigma so that the quadratic term doesn't depend on coupling. So that's the usual way to develop perturbation theory. And then coupling constant goes into the nonlinear terms. OK, so this calculation that we did just captured the leading, one of the leading order term in the dimension of uh, the sigma. And if you, if, if you want to get the 1 over n corrections, you have to include uh, uh, corrections to this two-point function. Okay? There will be interactions in this effective action, action for sigma, and they will correct this dimension slightly. Okay, <coughs> so but now let's see what happened. Remember that this sigma field is nothing but phi square operator. But the phi square operator in the UV theory at uh, well at dimension d minus two, right? And if we are in dimension three, at dimension one. Okay, and now we see that for, I was doing this at arbitrary d. So for any d, we start in the UV with this uh, phi square operator having dimension d minus 2. And once we reach the IR, that operator has dimension 2 plus 1 over n correction. Okay. <coughs> so at large n, uh, At large n, we have found this result that here in the UV, so, so here delta is the dimension of phi i, phi i. So in the UV, we start with phi i, phi i having dimension d minus 2, right? That's just the bare dimension in the free theory. And uh, once we are down in the IR, that becomes 2. 
plus one over n corrections. Okay. This uh, th note that this doesn't depend on uh, on the dimension. Okay. So there is always this uh, uh, for any d, this goes from two d minus two to two plus one over n correction. Okay. <coughs> You can also see that this is consistent with the epsilon expansion. If you do the, so in the epsilon expansion, everything is more straightforward. You just have the epsilon, usual perturbative epsilon expansion. And here you find, if you try to get the dimension of the phi i phi i operator, you get, uh, I think, two. OK, so the epsilon expansion will give you this. Notice that this term is 1 over n at large n. So this agrees with large n, which tells you that result. OK? <coughs> OK, so if you, if you have never seen this, it may be useful to spend some time thinking about it, because I, I did it maybe quickly. Yes? Uh, OK, <coughs> thanks. So. Uh, yes, but here, so when I do these calculations, I always like to use some regularization scheme in which I don't have to worry about those terms. So, for example, if you use dimensional regularization, it's consistent. To, if you start with zero mass, you're not going to generate mass. Okay. If you use some cutoff, then you you can put the mass there, and you have to tune it in such a way that the physical mass is zero. But if you use uh, dimensional regularization, if you're interested in the conformal theory, you can start with massless action and the mass will not be generated. OK. <coughs> but of course, physically, yes, there is, you have to tune to the physical mass being 0. But in practice, we can avoid doing that explicitly. OK. OK, so this flow actually is uh, just a, it's here, there is less stuff to erase here. This example of the Wilson-Fisher fixed points of the ON models is just to, uh, one special example of a more general story, which is uh, double trace flows. So in general, the, if we have some CFT and we perturb it by the square of some single trace operator of dimension delta, so O delta is a single trace scalar primary. So that, that particular case is an example of this, where the CFT here is just a free CFT. And O delta is just this phi i phi i, which is a single trace operator in the language of vector models. And we square it. That's a double trace deformation. Double, so if uh, if two delta is less than d, then uh, this this is a relevant deformation, and that there is a flow. One can show by uh, large n techniques similar to the ones that I did there that there is a flow from the unperturbed CFT. Let me call this CFT zero. There is a flow from the CFT0 in the UV to the new CFT, I may call it CFT uh, IR. There is a flow triggered by this. And uh, the general result that you can derive from large N techniques, very similar to what I did here in this specific example is that the dimension, so the dimension of O delta 
here in the UV is delta. So this delta just denotes the dimension of the oh, this perturbing operator. So th uh, this is this is an operator, of course, which is present in this CFT, and you perturb it by adding the square of it, and delta denotes the dimension in the UV, right? And uh, when you flow down, the dimension of O delta is now d minus delta plus one over n corrections. So this can be proved by very similar techniques that I did here, and you can check paper by Gupser and Klebanov, for example, where this is explained uh, in detail. So again, this the, what I just described there is just a special example of this, where the dimension of the perturbing operator is d minus 2. And in the IR, I, I'm getting d minus, d minus 2, which is 2 plus 1 over n corrections. Okay. Okay, so this is about CFT. Now, what is the ADS? Uh, what is the ADS uh, dual of this deformation? What happens on the ADS side? Where, when? Uh, what does it mean adding this deformation and flowing to this new IR fixed point? Well, so this uh, is well understood. There. So here is some reference, Klebanov Witten 99. Well, maybe let me put it. They may have more than one paper in 99. And uh, Witten. Are you discussing any of this double trace flows draw in your lectures? Or no? <coughs> OK, so let me just explain it uh, uh, briefly. So what happens? So we have in the CFT, so let me recall the basic dictionary. If in the CFT we have an operator of dimension delta, then in ADS we have a scalar field with mass square delta, delta minus d, right? where this delta is related to how this field scales as you send z to 0, which is the boundary of ADS. Okay? So I'm using Poincare coordinates. This delta is such that as z going to 0, maybe this is small, z to the delta times some function of x plus order of d. Okay? So the, this delta is related to how this field scales. Okay. Now, when I was discussing the duality between the vector model, the free vector model, and uh, um, the ADS side, I was just setting delta equal d minus two, and then check that that gives me, gives me the right mass. But of course, if you look at this equation, it's quadratic. So if you want to determine what is the delta corresponding to a given mass, there are two solutions, right? <coughs> uh, So if you just solve that equation for the delta in terms of the mass of the field in the bulk, that's what you get. And typically, uh, in, in usual examples, it's clear which choice you make. Usually the plus choice is the correct choice, because the minus choice will go below unitarity bound in the dual CFT. Right? So recall the unitarity bounds. Have you discussed unitarity bounds last week? Yes. So for a scalar, for a scalar operator, well, let me just remind 
few of them. Although the one that is relevant uh, not right now is just the first one. Okay, so in, uh, in, uh, in any CFT, the unitarity bound for a scalar operator is that the dimension has to be greater or equal than d over 2 minus 1, where the, this is saturated when the, that operator is a free scalar field, right? Same for Fermion here, and the, the well, where the, the bound corresponds is saturated for a free Fermion. And this is the, <coughs> the unitarity bound for a higher spin operator, which is saturated when the higher spin operator is a conserved current. You can see that this is the dimension, for example, of those bilinear operators in the free scalar theory, which are phi phi and s derivatives, right? So it's d minus 2 plus s. OK, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean 1 half. Maybe, OK, thank you. <coughs> OK, so, um, so usually, for a generic value of this mass, if you want to describe unitary CFTs, at the boundary, the plus choice is the only one that gives you something above this d over 2 minus 1, right? Because typically, for generic mass, this will be bigger than 1, OK? But if the mass lies in some uh, special range, Uh, so this part, this part of the bound is just the brighter loner friedman bound. It's just so that the square root doesn't give any, anything imaginary. Okay? So that we always impose if we want uh, uh, some uh, stable theory in ADS. This side is what you have to impose in order to, have unitarity, to be above unitarity bound. Okay? So if the mass lies in this range, then... Both delta plus and minus are above unitarity. And so you can uh, really choose either one of them as your boundary condition for your scalar field. And depending which uh, choice you make, you are describing either side of this RG flow. So yeah, you have the same, the same ADS theory in which there is this scalar field with some given mass. If this given mass is between those two points, then you, can, you have two solutions, and the two solutions correspond to these two CFTs. Okay? So in the ADS4 higher spin theory, for example, we have seen that we have m square equal minus 2, uh, well, in units of ADS radius. And you see that this value is uh, indeed in that range. Uh, okay, And then you have two choices, so the two roots are delta equal to 1 or delta equal to 2. So this corresponds to the, uh, so if you choose, if you make this choice for your boundary behavior of the scalar field, the dual theory is the free vector model, where the phi square operator has dimension 1. If you make this choice, then the dual is the, this interacting critical theory, where the scalar operator has dimension 2, right? So. If you make the choice that delta equal to 1, then uh, the dual CFT is the free vector model. If you make the other choice, the dual CFT 
is the IR fixed point or uh, critical when model. disintegrating okay so basically this was the one of the main things pointed out in that Klebanov and Polyakov paper by adapting something that was well understood for general double trace flows in ADS-CFT by adapting that to this uh, particular case they uh, pointed out that with the same ADS-4 Vasiliev theory, you could describe two dual CFTs, either a free one, if you make this choice, or an interacting one, which is this interacting critical M model, if you make this other choice. Okay, so but you may ask what happens to the higher spin uh, operators? This is an interacting theory, so we wouldn't expect to have higher spin operate, cons exactly conserve higher spin operators. Any questions before? Yeah. Uh, you mean along the flow? Yes, you can choose uh, something which is called uh, mixed boundary conditions, in which you have uh, a superposition of both uh, roots. So that's a, that's a non-conformal uh, boundary condition for the scalar. It interpolates between the UV boundary condition and the R boundary condition. Yes, you can do that. <coughs> okay, so so in, in this uh, critical CFT, we still have these operators. So we still have these operators. They are still uh, primary operators of our CFT. But now they are not exactly conserved anymore. <coughs> but the way they are not conserved is very special in the sense that this uh, non-conservation is, uh, is very small in the large and limit. They are only slightly non-conserved. Okay. So if you look at the equation that the divergence of this operator satisfies in this theories, so this was zero in the free theory. If you check what, what it is in, the, in this critical fixed point, it's something like this. Uh, this is some powers. Let me write it down and explain. So this divergence is non-zero, but it's equal to uh, something which is the product of two single trace operators. So it's a double trace operator. And uh, so here I'm using operators which are normalized so that the two-point function is uh, one at large n. So th that's why there is this factor here. So this k just denotes this operator, which here is written schematically. This is a double trace operator. <coughs> and it's easy to see that if this is the case, if the divergence, if the divergence of the higher spin currents is equal to a double trace operator, It follows that this operate that the conformal dimension of this operator is the one which would be for a conserved current plus one over n corrections only, okay? plus some uh, number which depends of a, on s, n plus one over n squared, and so on. 
So there is not, not a term of order n to the 0 okay? if, uh, if this, mixing, if this uh, divergence is equal to a double trace operator then you can show that the anomalous dimension starts at 1 over n. So remember that 1 over n is the coupling constant in the bulk theory, it's like Newton constant. <coughs> so this, in the dual theory, means that the, the dual fields are still classically massless. And the anomalous dimensions are generated through loop effects of this type. Where here we have uh, fields running in the loop. Okay. <coughs> so this is an effect of order 1 over n, because each of these coupling constants here is 1 over root n in this duality, as we discussed. So. This explained why, at the classical level, we still have the same higher spin theory, same Vasiliev theory. We're just changing boundary condition of the scalar field. And this is consistent with what we get here, because this, the dual fields at the classical level are still massless. And it's only through quantum corrections that we generate a non-zero mass for them. The way that this is possible is, that, uh, is the fact that in this loop, we will have the also the scalar field among all other fields. That scalar field has a different uh, propagator, depending whether we choose this, the first or the second boundary condition. So while well, this was, was never checked in detail, it should happen that if you choose this boundary condition, then this effect is 0. But if you choose the other boundary condition, this gives a non-zero uh, shift in the, in the mass, which reproduces this. Okay. So what has been checked is that if you take the difference of the calculations in the two theories, delta equal 1 and delta equal to 2, you do get the right uh, anomalous dimension. Uh, but it was not checked that if you just use this, you get 0. Okay? That's assumed. But if that's assumed, then you can see that the difference is, uh, correctly reproduces the anomalous dimensions. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, could you yeah. Oh, there are no indices. Well, it, it will take some uh, effort to write down explicitly. It's just uh, so here we have the divergence of the operator of spin s. So this is an object which is spin s minus 1 and uh, has a dimension to leading order s plus d minus 1. So on this side, you will have some operator which has the correct quantum number. Okay, so this is just a schematic. There, S prime would be, so there will be a sum over uh, fill, uh, operators of the same type where this S prime is not the same as this S, and this J0 is the scalar, in such a way that this thing has the correct quantum numbers. Okay, I'm not writing it down explicitly because it's a little bit, uh, well, it's not that messy, but I don't want to write it down explicitly here. Okay, but it, it's just schematic. You can see explicitly that this is the structure, and you can actually derive what that operator is if you start from the action of the critical line model written in terms of sigma field. And then you, you, by using equation of motion, you compute what is the divergence of this operator. Uh, so you will have the equation of motion for phi will be something like sigma phi i, okay? let's say with a 1 over root n. In the free theory, that's 0. When that is 0, these operators have uh, 0 divergence. When it's non-zero, you produce uh, something on the right-hand side. Okay? This j0 essentially is this sigma. So if you want to try it, you can just uh, write down the action for the quartic theory in terms of sigma. And that's the simplest way to derive what is this operator here on the right-hand side. Use the fact that the equations of motion are become this. Okay. But for our purpose, the explicit form of this operator is not too important. What's really important is just that it's a double trace operator. If this was a single trace operator, if there was some operator that you could write down here, 
with the correct quantum numbers and it was a single trace, then you would produce a term here of order n to the zero. Okay? So here will become a S. This is absent. If you have theories like n equal four superior mills, what I'm writing here is nothing else but the cusp anomalous dimension, right? There, the cusp anomalous dimension starts already at planar limit. Okay? In this case, it doesn't. So this term is not there. In that case, if you look at what is the divergence of higher spin operators, it's equal to some single trace operator of your theory in the n equal four case, or in any Young Mills type theories. And then you will produce uh, a leading n to the zero cusp anomalous dimension. But in these vector models, you don't. That's why um, the cl at classical level, the dual theory is still some higher spin theory. Masses are only generated through loop effects. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, now, this is just general, some general CFT with some general deformation. I'm just saying that if, if that's some operator, some single trace operator, and you deform it by, you deform your original CFT by the square of that, you, you generate a flow to a, to a new fixed point, and the dimension of the operator in the, in the fixed point is given by this. This is just one specific example of this general story, where O delta is phi i phi i, delta is d minus 2, and so d minus delta is 2. But this is more general. It works in any CFT, in any CFT which has a large n expansion. Then you, you have this flow. Well, OK, in general, you have to tune the, the mass term. You have to tune it. Um, so that the, the physical mass is zero in, in the IR. As I said before, in practice, most of the time, you don't have do, to do this tuning explicitly if you choose a suitable regularization scheme when you do these calculations of RG flows. OK. So before it was already, there was already a question whether we could do a fermionic version of these dualities. And uh, uh, yes, indeed, you can. So for example, <coughs> we could consider uh, just a massless Dirac fermion in three dimensions, or uh, more precisely, a collection of n massless Dirac fermions. Then this theory has a UN symmetry. Again, it makes sense to look at the UN singlet sector. And the UN singlet sector is uh, very similar. There is a scalar operator, which is the operator of psi bar i psi i. This operator now in three dimensions, what is the conformal dimension of this operator in, in this free CFT? Two. Two, right? Because the uh, in three dimensions, the fermion has dimension one, right? So uh, this has dimension 2. In general dimension, it will have dimension d minus 1, right? OK. And then there is, again, a collection of uh, higher spin operators, 
that you can, uh, well, you can check that they are present in this theory and they are exactly conserved. These operators now have this uh, down indices. These operators now have uh, one less derivative compared to the corresponding uh, scalar story. Okay, so again, the plus dot 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 means terms in which these derivatives uh, are distributed in different ways between this term and this term, uh, such that the, the full operator is conserved, symmetric, and traceless. Okay, so this. conserved. So what is the dimension of this operator? If it's a conserved current, what should be the dimension in three dimensions? Is S plus 1. And of course, uh, so that's the same as in the scalar theory, because in, in any CFT, if you have a conserved uh, operator of spin S, it must have dimension S plus D minus 2 in three dimension S plus 1. And that's why here we have one less derivative, right? just because the fermions have dimension 1. Okay, so that this is the uh, higher spin operator in this theory. F for spin one, for example, is the usual uh, current psi bar gamma mu psi, which doesn't have a derivative, as opposed to the scalar case. Right? Okay. So the spectrum is very similar, and then uh, you can argue in the same way as we did for the scalar theory that this should be dual to some higher spin theory. theory should correspond to some ADS higher spin theory with a scalar operator again sorry scalar field uh, what is the mass well it's the same mass as I had before because we already know that delta equal to is one is another root that gives the same mass right so it's the same mass and then there are again the massless fields. So this looks looks so far the same as what I was writing for the scalar theory, but is it really the same higher spin theory? Well, it cannot be the same higher spin theory. Uh, one thing is that the spectrum is not exactly the same because this operator here is a, is a parity odd operator in three dimensions. So this uh, scalar field here is actually a pseudo scalar in ADS4. And moreover, you can see explicitly that the correlation functions of operators in this theory, in the CFT, are different from the one in the scalar theory. Uh, that means, for example, if you look at the three-point function of stress tensor in the CFT, again, it will be computed by some Witten diagram, where here we have the graviton. But now this must be equal to T, T, T in a fermion theory. Well, before we had that this was supposed to be equal to T, T, T in a boson theory. And th those two structures are different. Right? In a general CF CFT, as we said last time, you get a linear combination. Now, if, you have, if you have a dual which exactly corresponds to that, you must just reproduce the fermion structure. And in the scalar case, you must just reproduce the boson structure. So this coupling is different from the higher spin theory that is dual to the scalars. Okay? So we have different cubic coupling from the scalar case. So even though the spectrum looks very similar, this, these two theories are inequivalent. There are two inequivalent higher spin theories in ADS4. Uh, <coughs> and indeed, it was known before this ADS-CFT story was understood, it was known that in Vasiliev construction, there are two inequivalent theories, which were called uh, type A and type B theories.
Okay, there's the th theory which was called type A. This theory has a, a scalar, <coughs> and there's a theory which was called type B, which has a pseudo scalar. Okay, this was known before the idea of CFTs, that Vassiliev equations have two special type of inequivalent theories that are called type A and type B. Uh, so they have almost the same spectrum, apart from this difference, but they have very different interactions. Okay? And we understand this uh, clearly from the point of view of the CFT, because the first variant is dual to a scalar vector model. And the second one to Fermion vector model. <coughs> this was uh, explicitly clarified by Setkin and Sandel and Lee Petko. And this was in the original, the, f the first one was in the original klebanov polikov paper, but in that paper they didn't discuss the type B theory. In a couple of later papers, people pointed out that this, there is this type B model and it has precisely the right structure to be dual to the fermion, the fermion vector model, okay? <coughs> now, in the same way as in this case, we could uh, describe either the free or critical vector model. Here we also have uh, the two versions, one free and one interacting version. The interacting version is just uh, the so-called critical gross novel model. So the gross novo model is the fermion model with a quartic fermion interaction. Now, in three dimension, this interaction is irrelevant. So there is, in this case, there, is, there isn't a flow from a free UV CFT to an IR interacting CFT. The flow is the other way around. By Largen uh, techniques, you can show in this case that there is a flow from a non-trivial, here there is a critical, uh, fermion in the UV, and in, uh, there is a flow to the IR where we have a free fermion. So in this case, the role of uh, UV and uh, IR fixed point is exchanged, but in, if you treat this theory in the Largen expansion, then things are uh, very analogous to what I did before for the scalar theory. But you have to keep in mind that uh, this is a irrelevant operator now. So what you're supposed to do is actually take the large momentum limit, not the small momentum limit when you study. So as I did before, you can uh, study this quartic interaction by introducing an auxiliary field. And then that auxiliary field is related to the psi bar psi operator and you do the same thing, but you have to take a large momentum limit instead of low momentum limit, because this is irrelevant. So in this case, we, the flow here in the free fermion theory, we have a IR dimension, which is exactly two, which is the dimension of the psi bar psi operator. And here in the non-trivial UV theory, we have dimension D, minus delta IR plus one over N corrections. And that's one 
plus 1 over n corrections. Okay? So on, on the ADS side, again, the story is similar to what I discussed before. You still realize that this uh, pseudo-scalar, well, it has the same value of the mass, so we have delta equal 1 or delta equal 2 choice. In this case, the delta equal 2 choice will produce uh, uh, the dual of the free vector model and will give exact higher spin currents. And if you make the other choice, you will have slightly broken higher spin symmetries with the same similar type of non-conservation equation as I wrote for the scalar case. Okay? So <coughs> let me summarize all this in a table. So we have two models, type A and type V. Those are the higher spin theories. And uh, in uh, each of those models, you have a scalar field with mass square equal minus 2. And you have a choice of delta equal to 1 or delta equal to 2 scalar boundary conditions. So this is the bulk scalar boundary conditions. So if you make the delta equal 1 choice and have the type A higher spin theory, uh, what's in this box? It's the free uh, UN or ON vector model, where UN or ON uh, will give you either the theory with all spins or the theory with only even spins. Right, and uh, delta equal to two is the critical ON model or UN. Okay, and uh, in the type B case, the situation is uh, exchanged. I didn't discuss ON in this case, but you, instead of Dirac, you could take Majorana fermions in three dimensions, and then you have a theory with ON symmetry, and you, you then get a spectrum which only has even spins, the same thing as we discussed there. Uh, <coughs> and here you have the critical, uh, critical gross novel. OK? So in these two boxes, the higher spin symmetry is uh, slightly broken by 1 over n effects. And that gives non-trivial uh, anomalous dimensions for higher spin currents. And in these two boxes, the higher spin symmetry is exact. Okay. <clears throat> Do I have one minute? OK. So tomorrow, we'll see that there is actually a wide generalization of this. Uh, which <coughs> will come out by thinking more carefully about how do we impose the singlet sector restrictions on the CFDs. We'll see that to do that, natural ways to introduce gauge fields. And then instead of these vector models, we will have uh, some gauged vector model coupled to Chern-Simons field. And that will lead to a generalizations, generalization of these dualities in which we have neither type A or type B, but something in between in the ADS side. Okay. I guess we'll continue tomorrow then. Any question? <laughs> yes. So you could combine, you could do something like a type AB model. So you could take a, you could take a vector model. Uh, <coughs> let me write it in the free version, right?
you could take this uh, simple free vector model, which involves uh, uh, n scalars and n fermions, right? And uh, look at un singlet sector of this theory. Then there will be, for each, for boson boson and fermion fermion, we have the same thing as we had before, right? But in addition, there are uh, half integer spin operator. <coughs> which are UN invariant. For example, psi bar i phi i will be dual to some spin one half field in the dual theory. More generally, we can have something like psi bar i derivatives phi i, which will be dual to some uh, half integer. If these are s derivatives, s plus one half uh, higher spin field <coughs> in the ADS theory. Okay, so that will give you some uh, Vasiliev theory, which uh, involves <coughs> both uh, bosonic and fermionic higher spin fields. <coughs> yeah. Any other question? Yes. Uh, <coughs> okay. <coughs> so the critical gross novo model as uh, the standard epsilon expansion description is in 2 plus epsilon dimension, where because that's uh, mar marginal there. But there is actually also um, a description in 4 minus epsilon dimension, which I didn't want to go in, well, in detail because it takes time. We can call it a gross novo yukawa model, which is uh, an action which involves fermion plus an extra scalar plus uh, Yukawa interaction plus another coupling. You have this model. This model now has uh, two Relevant, two relevant uh, operators in dimension less than four, which has these two operators. So there is a, there is a, in this case, there is a flow from a free theory of n fermions plus one scalar to an interacting theory in the IR. That interacting theory in the IR can be argued to be the same as the, <coughs> as the, <coughs> as this UV fixed point that you have here. <coughs> but in this description is a, uh, is really a more standard flow in which you flow from. Uh, UV, you have free n size plus one scalar. And here you have some, in the IR, you have some critical theory, which is uh, equivalent to that theory. Okay, It takes some time to explain why. But uh, one part of the logic is that in this fixed point, we only get, we always get a scalar operator which has dimension one plus one over n corrections, as we, and this can be done in any dimension between two and four in the large n limit. So this dimension uh, becomes uh, the dimension of a free field if we are in four dimension of a free scalar field. That's why essentially you generate one extra free scalar field if you start from being near four dimension. But then once you have a free extra scalar field, if you want to do 4 minus epsilon expansion, you have to include all possible um, terms which are marginal in 4 dimension and relevant below 4. So that's the model you naturally get. And you can make some pretty detailed checks that uh, dimensions of operators at this, crit as this IR fixed point of this theory are the same as, as the ones at the UV fixed point of this theory. Okay. <coughs> Any other question? Okay, <clears throat> so continue tomorrow. <clears throat> Still no higher spins. <laughs> Yeah. Did, did this look a lot or 
Did I run too fast today? No, ah, you probably. I think it's normal. You probably were working on your stuff. <laughs> Oh, I, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure. 